Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Dr. Turpo Show, where I interview people who have been successful in different areas of life and in different industries, and I really want to learn from them, and, and I know you'll enjoy learning from them as well. What are some of the things that uh, help them to evolve into the successful people that they are today? And so um, today I have a very interesting guest. I'm, I'm sure you, everybody's going to be really excited about this one. We have well-known um, architect, entrepreneur, artist, uh, Oscar Spike Harris. So I'm, he's a good friend of mine, very successful person, inspirational person. And I just thought that people would really enjoy this interview talking with this very interesting guy. So uh, before we get into the interview, I just want to encourage everyone, if you like this video, please click like. Also, please, you know, share this video with others. When we hear these stories, I think nothing is more interesting than people's stories. If you talk to people long enough, you can learn something for everyone. So if you find something that's inspiring, something that other people might enjoy in this interview and other stories and other videos as well, please go ahead, click share and share this video with others. And as always, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. All right, without further ado, let's jump on into the interview. Hey Spike, how you doing, sir? Wonderful, wonderful. All right, thank you for spending time with us this morning. And so we can learn a little bit about you and you can share with us some things that might be helpful for us. So let's jump right into the interview and let me ask you some questions here. The right. first question is, just kind of tell us, uh, where did you grow up and what was, what was it like for you as a kid growing up? Oh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share my story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a blessing in itself. Most definitely. <laughs> Listen, uh, I grew up in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on an area called the Hill, hmm. the Hill District, which was a predominantly African-American community. Okay. On top of the hill, they called it Sugar Top. Hmm. Sugar Top is where the doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs oh. <laughs> aspired to be on top of the hill. And my parents were fortunate enough to be one of those groups. All right. On top of the hill. So that's where I, I pretty much uh, come from. My parents, uh, went to the University of Pittsburgh, graduates in pharmacy in 1918. That's where wow. they met each other. Wow. <laughs> so uh, that's important to understand. Uh, my brother is 15 years older than me. He went on to go to med school at Northwestern. He's probably one of the first blacks to go to med school at Northwestern. Wow. Mm -hmm. That was way back then. Uh, all of my family are entrepreneurs, have always been entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So I grew up on the hill, as mm -hmm. they say, and uh, it, was a, it was a cool place, you know. We, uh, no, I had a lot of fun. I was raising hell up there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was a little bad boy in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing all sort of mischievous things, you know. Like I took you to take my parents' car out when they didn't even know it when I was 12 years old, stuff like this, you That's know. Well. <laughs> And I was, and then I got in trouble. But uh, you know, I'm taking a juvenile court and everything that you know during that particular time. But I survived. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing was up there, we were making uh, a model airplanes. Mm. Uh, we were making soap boxes. You know, those soap boxes. You fix them up and put four wheels on them. You run them down the hill. You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing that I come from, which is very interesting, is I come from mentors. Mm. Black community mentored me. Good. Then, when I'm 10 years old and 12 years old, I had a senator, state senator, Leroy Urbis. He was the one that got me into airplanes and model airplanes and remote control. This was at 12, 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old. Very good. So we had that. Then, then my, uh, uh, the postman was the head of the scout. Now, he was a scout master. And he helped me as far as scouts. I had, had difficulties at the time of being able to, you know, I was not a fighter or anything like that, and they used to pick on me a little bit. But I grew up, and, then, and, and he taught me how to stand up for myself and fight. So after a while, I was fighting all the time. That was a problem. <laughs> Too much fight. Mm -hmm. But uh, my parents, my mother took me to Europe when I was 10 years old. Wow. So at 10 years old, I went to the Louvre. Mm -hmm. I went to Switzerland, I went to Germany, I went to Amsterdam. 
and the impact of that of going to those particular places and seeing art and architecture really impacted me at the point I did not really realize it at the time, but I was always also drawing all the time. So by the time I reached uh, high school, I liked to build things, mm -hmm. some boxes and airplanes, but when I went to high school, I was doing very well in drafting class and shop. <laughs> very good. I wasn't doing too well in the other classes. Right. I was picking <laughs> C grades and that's about it. Yeah. But, but that drafting. And also I had a stammer then, a big bad stammer. And they had me in French class. <laughs> <clears throat> and I had a stammer and I couldn't even speak English. Right. <laughs> they had me in French class. So that made it sort of difficult there. Yeah. But during the summers I worked at various summer activities. I was a, a camp counselor. Uh, I got little jobs working uh, for different companies actually during the summer. So I was always sort of busy. And then uh, before I went to college, I, I got to be an Eagle Scout. Oh, excellent. So that's that. So, so that's my part of where I was, grew okay. up. Now you tell an interesting story that uh, uh, sometimes I've heard you tell. You had a, a, a chance meeting with someone um, at, a, at an amusement park area or something like that. No, no, no. My, uh, when I was in this, uh, my parents took me around. I went to Walt Disney Studios in yeah. California. Studios. Okay, very good. And so what was, I was going thing? through the studio. My parents said, take my drawings because I was always drawing things. And, and, and that's what I told uh, 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 and your son, always put your drawings. If your child's drawing, put, uh, put the drawings in a portfolio. But they all had a portfolio, but also they had me take it with me. All right. <clears throat> so I was out in California, went to Walt Disney Studios and went through the lunch area. And there was Walt Disney himself sitting there eating a sandwich. <laughs> so they go up and they go up and introduce yourself. So I went up and introduced myself. And I had this uh, the stammer thing I had to get over to and showed him my pictures there. And, and he said, wow, this is the greatest drawings I've ever seen. You're going to really be something. Right. He up to good work. And he signed it, you know. Wow, that's excellent. So that was, that was so... So that was really inspirational. So okay. that was helpful for me. Yeah, I'm sure that was. A, a comment like that from him, was, I'm sure, meant a lot. So right, right, right. So, and then you tell us a little bit about your college years. Uh, well, what happened is my grades weren't that good. I was getting in trouble and everything. So my, my parents said, well, he's got to go to college, you know, because he's, you know, let's find out what he's going to do. So I've got a general education at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. At time, now that's a HBCU university. Went there, 400 African-American men way out in the boondocks. Mm -hmm. And I was partying, I was having a good time there. And it wasn't a question of what I wanted to do, it was a question of what I did not like to do. Okay. So it was not, they said, oh, well, you have a major in history. No, I don't like history. Got a major in English. No, I don't like English. Major in all these things. And the last one was mathematics. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, mathematics will do. Mm -hmm. I got a major in something. So I majored in math. My senior year in math, I punched out all of my classes. Mm. But I had this beautiful girl coming down for graduation. I told her she got to come down for graduation. The dean says, hey, you're not going to graduate. You just punched out all these uh, 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 classes. When you I say said, punched hey, out, that means you weren't doing well? Doing well. I failed four advanced <laughs> mathematics, <laughs> symbolic logic, abstract algebra, all these very complex things. Right. He said, Man, Dean, uh, Dean said, you're not going to grab. I said, Dean, I got to grab. He said, why is that? I said, because I got this fine young lady coming down. She's an IQ 160, and I've already invited her. He mm -hmm. said, well, you're out of luck. I said, Dean, I got to graduate. Mm -hmm. So I went to Temple University in the evening, mm -hmm. doubled up there at Lincoln, ended mm -hmm. up with a 3.5, <laughs> and I graduated. The girl <laughs> came, had a wonderful time. It's the first time I learned about the girl was the most important thing here. <laughs> learned about this, so I'm going to do my mathematics thing to get the girl to come, and she wouldn't think bad of me, you know? Right, right. So um, 
that was persistence and you had some motivation too. Motivation, you gotta have motivation, <laughs> motivation, motivation. But then I was still painting too, and the girls, they liked my paintings all the time. So that was, I was painting, so painting really uh, helped. Um, yeah. Well, that's admirable that you had that level of persistence to not give up and that stick to itiveness. So that's admirable. Right. Very good. Now, right after that, when I left there, I went to get a job in the mathematics world. And I went to get these doctors in mathematics. Mm -hmm. I didn't do well in that interview. Okay. I did not do well. And, and that made a big change in me. I said, I am not going to do anything that I don't do exceptionally well. And that was drawing. Mm -hmm. And then that's how I evolved into this idea of being an architect. So he's tell people, yeah, I'm going to be an architect. So it's like going with your strengths. Go, God has given each of us mm -hmm. a special talent. My mother used to tell me this. You have, you have been touched by God by a special talent. It's up to you to find out what the talent is. Right. And focus on that one talent so that you're not going to work every day. Mm -hmm. I never worked any time in my life. Mm -hmm. I've never gone to work. Yeah. I'm going to have fun every day. Right. So I don't work. I, I mean, I'm enjoying my, I mean, I just focus on that. So I'm going to focus on a long time. Yeah. And that's what I tell people. It's not only follow your passion, what you enjoy. It's also follow what you're good at, too. And good so, at. And set and goals. For of both of them. Yeah. And just focus way down and get some goals set. And every day you have to accomplish a certain goal, certain goal, certain goal. And you keep your focus and do it long enough. Yep. And one day, boom, you arrive at that place that you uh, want to go to. Okay. So I graduated from uh, from Howard. Uh, then uh, so I decided you, to go to Howard right after. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I graduated from Lincoln University. And then I said, I want to be an architect. So then I applied to architectural school in Howard. Okay. So I got to Howard. All of a sudden, those C grades went to A grade, and it was easy. It was fun. I was floating on top. I was the top student walking through there. You know, I'd have my creative ideas, my sketches. Man, they thought I was, you know, like really, I said, boy, this is cool. Because you were doing something you interested in. Yeah, and, I'm, and I, you know, I could work all night. It didn't bother me. <laughs> it was fun. The longer I worked, the better, the better it got. So really drawing, and, and I started believing in myself. Mm-hmm. Don't have to worry about anybody else. Mm -hmm. No one has to endorse me. My parents don't have to say nothing to me to endorse me. I endorse myself. Right. Excellent. You don't have to worry about anybody. There's a whole millions of people out here that have a perspective on what you're supposed to be doing and all this. Stuff. You have to believe in you. So Amen. I believe strongly in myself. So Amen. I went from there and then my girlfriend was in Pittsburgh and then they said, well, transfer from uh, Howard to Carnegie Mellon. Okay. Uh, and I went to Carnegie Mellon, uh, then that was a big change. Howard taught me how to draw buildings and put buildings together technically. Mm -hmm. Went to Carnegie Mellon, they weren't interested in you drawing buildings. And that was not important. Mm -hmm. The main thing is, can you think? Mm -hmm. Are you rational? Do you make the right decisions? Are you going in the right direction? Pretty drawings don't mean anything. But are you rational? And so I combined my math with all of that. Good. So I rose to the top of the class then. Very good. When I went into Carnegie Mellon, you know, I mean, I went into graduate school at Carnegie Mellon. I didn't, in architecture. I didn't go to undergraduate. Art. I went to graduate school in architecture. Excellent. And when I went in there, uh, the white student was predominantly white. They said, who is this brother coming in here, you know? <laughs> they didn't know I'm there to whip their behind. There you go. <laughs> That's the way I came in there thinking. Mm -hmm. I came from Lincoln University. Mm -hmm. I came from Howard University. And I believe in myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not intimidated. There you go. And, and, and man, I just, I, I just rose to the top there. And then I wrote a thesis. Uh, this, is in the, this, is in the, this is in the 60s mm -hmm. about designing transit stations. Mm -hmm. um, the criteria for designing them to produce safe environments to reduce crime. Okay. Now that's done in the 60s. Excellent, excellent. How they're just talking about it today, if you watch TV. Right. So thinking about how to, how to put that together. Okay. So, so that's my thesis thing. 
Okay, so what brought you uh, to Atlanta? And, uh, you know, what was it like for uh, Blacks back then and, and to be a Black architect? Okay, what brought me to Atlanta was my thesis. Oh, okay. My thesis was published on a national basis. Mm. Big company, transit company called Parsons Brinkerhoff, which does transit all over the world. They read it. They read the thesis. They said, who is this cat that's doing this stuff up in Carnegie Mellon? Hmm. They brought me down here. They paid for me to come down to Atlanta. I didn't come down here. Just hmm. They paid for me. They put me up in a hotel. They put, you know, they put us up, a car, everything else. Gave me a little money to spend, go to restaurants. But they, were, they wanted me to come. So then I said, yeah, this is, sounds pretty good. I want to work on big projects, by the way, too. I don't want to work on little things. Mm -hmm. I want to start working on big projects. So this thing of, of being in charge. So, so they brought me down. They made me a senior uh, draftsman mm -hmm. uh, at Parsons Brinker Home. So they had me way back with a whole lot of other people. And then one day, one of the managers named Pacheco, Will Pacheco, he came out and he said, I need a good man in management. And all of a sudden, my name rang out. They pulled me out of there and put me in management. They put me with a phone and said, you're in charge of the East Line, and you tell all these people what to do. Mm. The board of Parsons Brinkerhoff on what's happening in the whole architectural thing, the art program, the, all the design. You go to the board of Parsons Brinkerhoff, and you explain to the board members what's going on. Mm -hmm. So Will Pacheco was this guy, Will Pacheco, and gave me a lot of power at a young age. Now, I'm 32 years old. And what year is this about? This would be in, like, 72. Okay. But he gave me power, and, and he was one of the top guys, and he just pushed me out there. He said, hey, if you want people, if you want engineers to fly from California, anything, you just pick up the phone, you call them and tell them where to go. You'll need to check back with me. Okay. Well, here I am, a young African-American, mm -hmm. telling white people, especially old senior engineers, what to do. So they didn't like that too much, so they tried to go around me uh, to go to Will. Will said, no, you're not going around me. You have to go to me. So that empowered me. And then I started feeling you know, good about myself. I really, hey, you know, I know, I know how to put things together. Mm -hmm. So that what brought me here, and I worked a lot on the transit, like I laid out Five Point Station, conceptual, the concept of Five Point Station. And this, this is the, for our viewers will know, this is the uh, MARTA uh, rail system that we're talking about. MARTA intersection station. I laid out the concept for Peachtree Center Station, mm -hmm. conceptually. Is it going to go down mm -hmm. 150 feet in the ground or be up? near the surface, how the thing would integrate with the thing. I was the one laying it out, okay. conceptualizing. So I like that, you know. So uh, that's how I started. And then in 77 is when I decided I need to jump out on my own. Okay. Before we get to that now, during this process, um, I guess one of these girlfriends that you've been talking about, did you get married to one of these girlfriends? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got married uh, at, when I was up in Pittsburgh before, before I left. Carnegie Mellon, we got married, and we were down here, and then we had three children. And oh, I want to mention about the three children. By the time I mentioned about starting my own firm, mm -hmm. I had three children and a house that I just bought. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of responsibilities on me. Mm -hmm. And I came home. One night I said, Sylvia, I'm gonna, I want to start my own firm. And within a second, she said, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I looked up, you know, the water dri dripping out of the roof because I couldn't get the shingle. I couldn't pay for a roof. Right. Downstairs in the basement, the drains on the water thing, where I had water down in the basement. Mm -hmm. um, it was That's interesting. She had faith in you, your wife, Sylvia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's another important thing. Is, is the other important thing you got to have to be successful is you have to have a partner in life. Mm -hmm. Make a good choice in that area. Oh, you got to make the right choice. If you make the wrong choice, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care what your contacts are. You're not going to do well. Yeah. It's going to be very, very difficult. You know yeah. why? 
because you don't have time. I don't have time to go through a whole lot of, uh, I got to focus in on what I'm doing. I can't be worried about all this other stuff. So I could fly. Well, I'll tell you about that after the firm. We're going to start talking about the firm. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about your evolution and becoming more of an entrepreneur. Well, in 77, I just said, going to do it. And then I borrowed $15,000 from my brother. And he said, Greg, I'm going to let you have this $15,000 at 10% interest. He said, okay, fine. So I got my little space up here on Peachtree Street. That's, I had about 300 square feet of space with nothing in it. Mm -hmm. I, didn't have a, I didn't have a chair. I didn't have a phone. Finally, I got the phone, but it never rang. Mm -hmm. I got no mail. And I had no project. And... I was still, when I went to talk on the phone, I got very, very upset with myself because I couldn't say hello to the person because of my speech impediment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that, so I had to call home to my wife and said, would you please call me and please just let the phone ring a few times during the day so at least I know that I'm here, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. that's how I, that's how I started. And then I said, man, I got to get some projects in here. So otherwise, I'm, I mean, I'm up here and I borrowed the $15,000 and that's going to ruin my relationship with my brother if I fail. So being scared mm -hmm. is a good thing. Motivation. Scared will make you run fast. Yeah. If you're not scared, I've been scared all my life. Mm -hmm. So being scared is good, not bad. Makes you run good. Wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, do whatever you need to do, get it done. So I decided how I'm going to develop my business was go out at night to the big functions, like the big dinners, mm -hmm. and go out there. Oh, oh something's making a noise. Can you hear me? You, you, I, can, I don't hear anything else. Anything else. Uh -uh. Something's making a noise. Mm -hmm. Anyway, good. go out. And uh, develop my mindset at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, how you go to that? You go to the dinners, the big dinners, mm -hmm. and you get a single ticket. Mm -hmm. So you see everybody. You know how everybody sits around at those round tables? Right. What I do is go around and shake everybody's hand and introduce myself. I don't go there to eat and drink. Right, and that's not why and you did. don't go to be with your friends. You don't want to be with your friends. You already know those folks. Mm -hmm. So I circulate around and I tell them my story. I say, shoot, I'm out here. I don't have any projects. I went out here and I'm up here. Shoot, man, you got to give me, hook me up with something, you know. So they started with little projects, and finally I got my first project was a, a water treatment plant. Very good. But but my office was up on Peachtree Street, no air conditioning. So we worked on a water treatment plant. We had to strip down to our underwear. Mm, wow. And the bugs would come up and fry up because they'd open up the windows and they'd be burned up in the lights and they would burn down and fall down on your drawings. Because mm. these are all hand drawings that we're doing. Yeah. Mm. So there's hand drawings. That's what you call working drawings. Mm -hmm. Because they have little legs and other of the bugs that are dropping down on your drawing <laughs> called working <laughs> drawing. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the structures or designs that we might recognize that you were responsible for? Or, or All right, I'm just going to go through a few now. When I start my firm, then I want to be in charge. I want to be, I'm not want to be that I'm working for somebody else. I want to work for myself. Mm -hmm. That's why I started my firm. So I want to be in the prime position. Mm -hmm. And prime means everything goes through you. You're the one making the choices. You're the one hiring people. You're the one controlling. So the projects I'm going to mention are projects, and there are just a few of them. I mean, I got a whole lot of them. I'm just going to name a few that you might be uh, yeah. familiar with. The, the government center, Fulton County Government Center downtown. as the prime architect on that. And we're talking about Atlanta, Georgia for our viewers. Okay. Yeah, Atlanta, Georgia. Fulton County Government Center, which is a $50 million project. Underground Atlanta, which is another, like a $70 million complete revitalization. The Sam Nunn Federal Center, which is a high rise, 1 million square foot federal uh, facility. Uh, the City of Atlanta Ports Facility. Uh, 
the Cab County Juvenile Court, Centennial Park, where the Olympics were. I did the look of the games. Right. What the look of the games are going to be. I did the at the airport. I'm very proud. I, we did. I did the atrium, which is the center circular piece with the skylight. Mm -hmm. and, and it's nice to see they're having functions in there, which I remember I sketched on a little piece of paper years ago on a piece of napkin, how that thing would be worked out. I was there last week, I was thinking about you when I was there last week. <laughs> oh, you were at the, there? The in the atrium? Every time I go there, I'm thinking about you. <laughs> okay, how's the atrium coming with that function? Good. Good. <laughs> yeah, and then, then I did Concourse E. Concourse E is the prime. We set it up for art. Okay. The whole place, if you know, you go and lay it up at art. Mm -hmm. That just didn't happen. I like art. I've been painting all my life. Right. <laughs> I said it's going to be about art and expressions of the spirit of the people of the South. So that's why I put it the way it's set up. And by the way, that's 50% African American art and 50% of all the money that went in there for the engineering and all that structural part of it. That's because I was in charge. Excellent. I controlled it. So I did that, and then we did the master plan for the airport in 2000. That's the $5.4 billion program. Mm. Then I managed the $5.4 billion program. Mm -hmm. That's managed all the architects, the construction, mm. uh, the runway, new runway that was put in, all of that sort of thing. Uh, then I did the Atlanta Public Schools Administration. I've done most of the public realm as a prime. You don't have that today. You don't have you don't have an African American doing any of that sort of thing today. Right. You lost a lot of ground. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we gotta we gotta make it up and keep moving forward. Thank you for people like you that are pioneering in those and making that headway. Hopefully, we can keep moving forward with that. Well, I try to I, now I try to work with the young people and try to get them fired up. But you know, I mean, it's up to them. You know, I can't. Right. I mean, it's gotta be within yourself when you willing to put in the work and the effort is necessary. Right. So but I've done I've done I've done four billion dollars in the ground. All right. Well very good. Never sued, never sued. Mm -hmm. And I've made over a thousand payrolls every two weeks. Wow. That's which excellent. I am the responsible party to make the payroll. And at one time I had a hundred people. Wow. I had them in the top buildings downtown. Mm. Fifty five park place I hit one whole floor, a whole whole place. Wow. All the international, the healing building. You know, I was, I'm thinking of some other places that you haven't named, but we can't name all your places. I don't have enough time <laughs> for that because you right. <laughs> So uh, you mentioned young people. And also, uh, currently, I know you've been recently working with a youth program. So tell us about a little bit more about what that is. Right. In 2004, because what happened is this. I found myself in a, in, a, in, a, in a space and time during all this time where the African-American community did not know what's happened. I was fortunate to come up through that thing where I could be at the table. I'm at the big table, not the little table. The big table where all the decisions are made, but I look around, I'm the only one there. Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, I got to start helping, you know, so I started working with young people. So in 2004, I started the uh, Atlanta Center for Creative Inquiry. That came out of Carnegie Mellon University, but it was reaching out to high school students, trying to inspire them in the world of creativity. Mm -hmm. So since that time, it's expanded and done well. We've, 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 we go through Georgia Tech University and send them to Harvard University and all sorts of things. But you can look it up at the Atlanta Center for Creative Inquiry. And every summer, we have a one-week program. It's coming up. And we're fortunate to have the, uh, the Boulay, the Capital Boulay, mm -hmm. supporting us. Yeah. Uh, and that really made a tremendous difference. Good, good. Now, uh, you have a book. Um, can you tell people a little bit about your book and how they might be able to get a copy of it? Yeah. It's called The Memoir of a Master Architect. Mm -hmm. The Memoir of a Master Architect. And it tells about all these experiences I have. It tells all the stories that I just went over. M many, many more, but it's good for a young person. Good. Easily, not difficult. And you can easily get it at my website. Okay. Oscar Harris, F. 
F-A-I-A dot com. Okay, excellent. Oscar Harris, F-A-I-A dot com. Okay, well, I'm going to encourage our viewers to check out your website as well as uh, uh, possibly look, uh, getting a copy of the book as well. Thank you. Uh, so tell us about Oscar Harris, the painter. Oh, yeah, now, you got to understand here. When I started off, as I told you, I'm back there, years gone by, I told my parents I wanted to be a painter. They said, we well, got to find a job and at least you can get a, a paycheck. So I got, that's how I got into architecture. So right. I said, <laughs> But painting has always been my groove, you know. It's always been been there. I used to paint all the time, sell them at school. So now, what I, where my where I am right now is I'm I've gotten out of architecture. I don't do anything except paint. Mm -hmm. I don't do well. Of course, I eat and sleep and travel <laughs> and all that. But my whole focus is on painting because that's where my spirit is. And also, that's where my soul is. So I came into this world with the spirit of painting. That's the thing that got me going in architecture. Mm -hmm. But now it's relationship to my old my soul, and I integrate that with uh, jazz. So I paint jazz. It's called um, abstract expressionist. That's mm -hmm. that's what people call me. And right. you can see my work at Art by Oscar Harris. Very simple. Just pull that up. Art by Oscar Harris. Okay. And you'll see some of my pieces. But that's the blessing I have. I, I, I say, sure, now I've gotten older and everything, but I have that blessing that I have that 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 thing that's, that's really deep in my heart. Because when I get into that painting groove, man, I'm into a different world, and it's really, really... I know jazz inspires a lot of your paintings. Jazz, it? jazz inspires it because it's <laughs> improvisational. It's improvisational. So that photography, is photography, yeah. I'll give you an example. Photography is a moment thing. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Mm -hmm. You gotta be in the right position, mm -hmm. right there, and when you shoot that thing for a half a second, poop, mm -hmm. that's it, the image. In painting, it's a relationship you have to build with that painting over a long period of time until it's completed. So it's, yeah. and then I have to jab. Jazz is like a muse for you that gets that uh, creative spirit going with you as you're doing that process. Oh, really? Like Miles Davis, John Coltrane right. blowing, and they hit those riffs. Woo, 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 woo. Man, my brush starts going, man. I start hitting, you know. Woo, yeah, woo, woo, when was, woo. Uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, my dad was listening to WCLK uh, here in Atlanta, and I couldn't understand what all that, all that, I used to think it was a mess, you know, because my, when you're young and it's on an elementary level, you're just basically into melodies and basic harmonies. But as I've gotten older and I've lived some life under me and I have that maturity, I love jazz like crazy, man. It takes me to another place. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, jazz, <laughs> well, jazz, jazz takes you somewhere. It's it a vehicle. You appreciate that, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a vehicle. Mm -hmm. A lot of other music doesn't take you anywhere. It's just yeah. good for the time, but it just doesn't take you anywhere. Yeah, I'm looking at one of your pieces now. I have it hanging up in, in my house. I'm looking straight at it now. Uh, I think it's called Steaming. And uh, when it's, uh, my daughter came home from um, med school, she came home and she saw it. She said, oh, that's really nice. I said, your Uncle Spike, Spike did that. She said, yeah. She said, I, when I look at it, and she didn't know about your creative process. She said, when I look about, at it, I think of jazz. Well, I, I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told you. I told you. <laughs> that connection. Right, right, right. Look at right. That. <laughs> and that's, 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 that's the, that's the thing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, because that thing, that thing is internalized and it comes in, as far as African American people, it comes to us from our, from our saints, you know, yeah. back years ago through our heritage. So, that beat, that, that, that sound, the improvisation is the beautiful thing. It's improvisational. And my painting is improvisational, too. Because I don't know, when I go to paint, I don't know what I'm going to paint. I don't, know, I don't paint off of any pictures. Yeah. I paint straight from my mind. Yeah. And you're, and you're like uh, visually manifesting the jazz that's inspiring you. So that's that is correct. That's right. And I don't have anybody telling me what to do. I don't have to go to any meetings to get consensus. I don't have to show, hey, what you thinking? No, no, I don't right. do all of that you know, anymore. Right. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. I just, one last thing I'd like you to just share, if you have any advice for any future architects or any future entrepreneurs or any future artists in general, any people or young people today, what are some, any future advice, words of wisdom you can well, leave? Well, one thing is, the one thing is you got to believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. You don't need anybody else checking you out. And you don't have anybody to go around and say, well, what do you think? No, you just have to believe it. Once you really believe it, then it will manifest itself to you. Okay. Another point is very simple. I have always done this and it always is the best thing. Do unto others as you wish to be done unto. Yes. Life is nothing but a mirror. If you give off love, you will get love back. Excellent. All right? That's excellent, man. <laughs> and if you want to smile, then you smile to somebody else and you'll get it back. The more you give out, give away what you would want to receive. Amen. Amen. And you'll see, your life will, and then you'll be amazed at what starts happening to you. You, you just, but you know, when you're selfish and you know, yeah, no, don't do that, you know. And the other thing is find the right partner. If you're married or get together with the wrong person, you take too much energy and too much money and too much time. I've been blessed. My life has been, thank you, God. I've been blessed with, with a wonderful partner. I've been blessed with a wonderful career. I've been blessed with wonderful friends. And I've been blessed with the fact that I have my painting. Yes. And, and, and golly, I don't know how many more blessings I can get, bro. <laughs> Your cup runneth over. Yeah, and then I'm really blessed that I got you. Oh, okay. <laughs> but thank you. You have been, you and your family have been a blessing to our family as, as well. So thank you okay. very much. And thank you for today. Today's been a beautiful. I re really enjoyed it. I was really engaged the whole time. So I want to well, thank you very much, Doctor. I really do appreciate it. And thank you very much for the opportunity that I can share my story. That's a blessing in itself. All right. Well, much love to you and yours. All right. Thank you, Brother Spike. Peace. Take it easy. Mm-hmm. <laughs>